Hey, good morning. How is everyone doing today? Beautiful day out there, not quite as wet as yesterday, still wet. It looks like it's going to wreck my golf game. But hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet yet, my name's Gary. I'm one of the pastors here. Really glad that you've decided to spend some of your time with us today, whether that be right here in Theater 6, across the hall in our live stream venues, or right online. Hello, everyone in live stream land. Just really, really glad that you're here as we continue on in a series we started at the beginning of the month called why am I here? It's that existential question that we all end up asking at some point in our lives. Uh, and I don't necessarily mean, you know, why am I here in this place, in this theater, or this city, or this province, or this country, but that bigger question of why am I here on this planet? You know, what's my purpose for being here? Um, if you've missed any of the messages up to this point, you can always catch up online. Just go to TheMeetingPlace.org, and in the top right-hand corner, you'll see where it says Messages. Just click on that. Or if you've downloaded our app, you can find it there. Once you open it, right in the middle of the page, that home page, is Messages. Just click on that, and away you go. We also craft messages, uh, questions to go along with it, coffee questions. So if you're in a connection group, you can take what you heard on Sunday and go a little bit deeper with it. Uh, if you're not in a connection group, it's a great way to start one. You don't have to worry about what are we going to talk about because you have something. Um, but you can find those on, and online on our app or online at our web page. And I encourage you to do that. But I'm going to give you a quick thumbnail sketch on some of what we've covered so far. The first week, we discovered that we are created uh, and brought into this world by a very intelligent, very caring very creative God, and we were created on purpose for a purpose. We're not just an accident. We're not here to just take up space and use things. We're here for a purpose. And the first week, we learned how God created us to love us. It, he took great pleasure in, in creating us so he could love us. And his hope is that we would take pleasure in him and love him back. The second week, uh, or Rick Warren, listen to this. He, I love how he puts this in the Purpose Driven Life book that he wrote. He says, bringing enjoyment to God, living for his pleasure is the first purpose of your life. When you fully understand this truth, listen to this, you will never again have a, have a problem feeling insignificant. You ever felt that before? Like, I don't even matter? Last week, we looked at uh, how God created everyone, loves everyone, and wants us to be a part of his family. And so we explored, you know, the truth that we're not all automatically part of God's family. And again, that's why, you know, go back and listen to those messages and you can hear what we talked about there. But today we're going to look at purpose number three. The third reason that we believe we're here, the purpose behind why you and I are here on this planet, and it's this. We were created to become more and more like Jesus. We were created to become more and more like Jesus. Get this, author and former atheist, a guy named C.S. Lewis, you probably know him from the Narnia Chronicles. Uh, he grew up an atheist, didn't believe there was a God. Then he ran into a buddy, J.R. Tolkien, and they started talking. Uh, J.R. Tolkien was sharing his faith with him, and C.S. Lewis became a Jesus follower. And here's what he says, every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is simply nothing else. That's pretty powerful words. You know, before coming on staff here, and a lot of you will know this, but in case you're new and you don't, uh, I worked as a commercial diver. And it was an incredible job with some incredible side benefits, uh, one of which was my commute to work. Uh, for years, my wife, Lori, and I worked in North Vancouver in this dingy little office, and we lived in Maple Ridge. And we had to do that drive every day, but when I when I left that career and got into diving, I, I went from hopping in a car and driving 50 kilometers to work to hopping off a ladder and dropping 50 feet to work. And here's the thing. The best part was where I got to work, not in some dingy, dusty office, but on the bottom of the sea. And I would see some incredible things like this little guy. That's called a grunt sculpin. Uh, these fish are about the size of a loony, brilliant colors, 
And if you would hold your hand out, they would just swim and sit right in the palm of your hand. Just you know, like, hakuna matata, chill out. Like, no worries at all. Uh, then I ran into some of these guys. It's a Pacific Electric Ray. Now, you didn't want these guys snuggling up to you because they could actually produce about 45 volts of electricity. Not enough to kill you, but enough that it would induce a change of underwear, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but check this out. I used to come across these things. It's called a feather star. These things are a kind of a cross between an animal and a plant. They have roots and can attach themselves to a rock or the substrate, and they'll stay there, but when it's time to kind of pull up and move, they literally pull up their roots and move. And they use their arms, those feathered arms, to, to swim to the next spot where they lay down their roots and, and stay for a while. Incredible. The diversity and the creativity of, of life under the sea just goes on and on. I could stand here for hours telling you some of the things I saw. We're still discovering things from the sea. I don't know if you saw this story. It, it, came, uh, it happened in May. Uh, this thing washed up on a beach in California. It's called, it's been called due to its shape, it's called the football fish. And marine biologists figure it, it, it came from, it lives at depths of more than 900 meters, like 3,000 feet. That little appendage that you see hanging out actually produces light to attract things that it can eat. Just makes you wonder what else is lurking around down there. Let's go back to the sea. I mean, all of these creatures are absolutely and astoundingly beautiful, amazingly designed for their environment, perfect in their interactions with their world. And when I was on the bottom of the sea working away, every once in a while I would, I would come across some of these things. And I would stop and I would look at them and I, and I would ask myself the question, what makes me so darn special? compared to these amazing creatures. You ever wondered that? You know, maybe looking at a night sky and you see all the stars and the planets and all of a sudden you think, like, do I, where do I even fit in the scheme of this thing? It's a question that people have been asking since there pretty much there's people on this planet. And this question first shows up in the Bible in in a book called Psalms, it's a, it's a book that's full of prayers and, and songs that people wrote to God to just kind of work through what they were going through in life. And th there's a guy named David, wrote most of them. He's David of David and Goliath fame. And he wrote a psalm that poses this very question. And as far as historical records can tell, theologians, uh, they figured David wrote this before he came, became the king of Israel. He's just a shepherd boy, probably out in the fields, tending the sheep, when one night he looked up at the night sky. And this is what he said. Listen to this. When I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, and when he says your, he's referring to God, the moon and the stars that you, God, set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them? What human beings that you should care for them? It's another way of saying, you know, why am I here? You know, when, when it comes to answering that, that age-old question, why we're here, the Bible gives a very intriguing answer. And it's found at the very beginning of the Bible in a book called Genesis, which means beginnings. It's where the story of creation takes place. And we're going to jump in right near the end. God's almost complete completed uh, creating his masterpiece. He's created the light and the dark. He's created the land and the ski, sea, the sky, the planets, stars, plants, birds, fish, every other animal that walks and creeps along the face of the earth, from the African mole snake to the Zanzibar gecko and everything in between. And then he we read this, listen to this. After he's created all of that, he says this, then God said, let us make humankind in our image. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle 
and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And so God created humankind in His image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Just let that sink in for a second. You and I are created in God's image. Nothing else that God created, birds, fish, beasts, were created in, in His image. Just, just humans, just you, just me. It seems that we humans are given an extra shot of awesome sauce when it came to creation. How much of an extra shot? Well, David goes on and, as he's writing this psalm out. And right after he says, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? He writes this, he says, you made them, referring to humankind, you made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You gave them charge of everything you made, putting all things under their authority, the flocks and the herds and all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and everything that swims in the ocean currents. What David is saying, if you just picture it, is like, God, you're right here, and we're right there. We're not God, but we're right there. And then comes the rest of God's creation. That's pretty heady stuff, isn't it? But, you know, to keep our egos in check uh, and really grasp what it means to be created in God's image, we would do well to look at that in the context of the Bibli whole biblical narrative. So we're going to start in the Old Testament. We're going to start in Genesis 1 and 2, where the, the ideal is introduced. Everything is perfect. The temperature is perfect. The weather is perfect. God creates humankind, and the relationship between man and woman is perfect. The relationship between God and humankind is perfect. And after he created humankind, he placed them in paradise. Or was there something more to it? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to throw an idea there for you this morning uh, to think about. I came across this a few years ago when I was uh, doing my master's. And it really helped me uh, better understand uh, what it means to be created in God's image and why it is so important. One of our purposes is to become like Jesus, okay? Uh, author and Old Testament theologian, a guy named John Walton, and it's not the John Walton from the Waltons, you know, that show from the 70s, it's not that guy. Uh, he wrote a book titled The Lost World of Genesis 1. Fantastic book. And he takes us back to uh, the context that that was written in, what was happening, how ancient Near East uh, civilizations would talk about creation and higher beings and stuff. And in this book, he explains how the practice for ancient Near East civilizations would be that oftentimes they would create a god, god of fertility, a god of you know, food, whatever it happened to be. Um, and what they would do is after they created this god and they, they would start serving this god, they would build a temple. And then the last thing they would do after they completed the temple is they would craft an image of that God and place it in the temple so the people that were going there to worship and serve this God would know what that God looked like. Okay? So with that in mind, here's what John Walton posits. This is, this is, this is what he lays out. This is the idea he puts forth. That the temple that God built is the world. And the last thing, when he was done creating it all, the last thing he placed in it was an image of himself, humankind, you and me, to represent him to the rest of the world. So when people looked at us, they would see God. It's interesting to think about. You and I were created, fashioned, crafted, made in God's image in order to represent Him and reflect His character to the rest of the world and to each other. And to, to kind of help us 
get a visual of it. Uh, our author and pastor and theologian, N.T. Wright, he uses the analogy of an angled mirror. And, w- and w- through this, he, 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 he describes what it's like, what it means to be made in God's image and why it is so important to tap into this third purpose of becoming more like Jesus. He, he, he says that with a mirror which is us, we're the mirror reflecting God's image at 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 the proper angle, God can be reflected out into the world the way he's supposed to be. And the world, when they look at us, they would see God. But then all of that changed. And we read about what happened in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve were deceived. God's creation was corrupted. Sin entered the world. And we, the mirror, got bumped, twisted. And now, the image of God is distorted. It's kind of like uh, if you go to Playland or some carnival and you go to those fun house and they got those weird mirrors and you stand in front of it and it just distorts your, your image like you know the ones on the screen there. It's kind of what happened when we got bumped. And now when we look at each other, instead of seeing God as he really is, kind and compassionate and gracious and merciful and patient, we see an image of God that is distorted because we have been marred by sin. And more often we're anything but kind and compassionate and loving and patient and gracious and merciful toward each other. And so for some, when they look at us, They project our image and what we're like onto God. Blaise Pascal, French mathematician, once said, in the beginning God created man and then man returned the favor. Meaning we created God in our image based on our experiences here on earth. And so for some, when they look at God, if the people in their their lives, someone that was important to them was angry all the time, they would just assume God's angry. For others, God was just distant, uncaring, didn't care. He was disappointed all the time, disgusted, hard to please. And it's no wonder people want nothing to do with him. And so if you keep reading through the Old Testament, pictures like these emerge constantly. Uh, You read story after story of people hurting people, People exploiting people. People uh, exploiting creation for their own gain. And that is what happens when people forget what they were created to be. When they forget that they are image bearers of the creator God. Now let's fast forward to the New Testament. The opening of the New Testament is the Christmas story. It's when God decided to come to this planet to save us from ourselves. It's the incarnation. Carnation, carne meaning putting meat on. That's what God did. He put on flesh and bone and became one of us and he walked with us. And he, he, he taught us what it was like and what God was like and how to, to, to interact with him and interact with each other. Paul, one of the earliest church uh, planters, wrote these words to uh, some people in a church that were kind of losing touch with the idea of who they were in Christ. And he said this, he said, he, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. If you want to know what God is like, look to Jesus. He's the one true, perfect reflection, the complete image of God. And by looking at him, we're able to see what it means to embrace the full image of God because God, Jesus was God in human form. In essence, what God did when he came here as the man, Jesus, is he bumped the mirror back into place. And if you read through the the biographies of Jesus in the Bible, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it doesn't take long for you to 
see how Jesus was different than what was expected. How living in God's kingdom is completely upside down compared to what anyone thought it should be like. It was countercultural in so many ways. Jesus showed and taught how the, the first will be last and the last will be first. That's pretty upside down. He taught how servants were the greatest of all. And he taught how loving your enemies, those that are hard to love, those that don't think like you, look like you, dress like you, vote like you, giving your life up for the others, that is where real life is found. And Jesus didn't just teach it. He demonstrated it. In the greatest demonstration of love the world has ever seen. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. When we look at Jesus, we're able to see a God who is not as expected. We don't see a God who is angry or disappointed or disgusted or distant. We see a God who cares, who's full of compassion, mercy, grace, forgiveness, love. Jesus came so that you and I could take on an entirely new way of life. A God-fashioned life. A life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces his character in you. That's becoming more like Jesus. God wants to develop in you and me the character traits that Jesus had and demonstrated. What are those traits? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Imagine having those. Oftentimes in church world, those are referred to as the fruits of the Spirit. And you may be thinking, well, what does that even mean? Fruits of the Spirit. Well, um, when Jesus left to go back to be with his Father in heaven, when he, when he commissioned his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, and he sent it back to heaven. Before he did that, he promised that he would be with them always. And he would do it by sending a counselor, a comforter that would be inside us. And that comforter, that counselor is God himself in the form of the Holy Spirit who actually resides inside of us. And that happens the moment we receive God's love and offer a forgiveness and we begin to follow him, as clumsy as it may be. It's, it's, it's radical for sure, <laughs> kind of strange, but it's life transforming. When you and I live with God inside of us, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that Jesus exuded will become more and more evident in our lives as the Holy Spirit works in and through us and transforms us to be more like him. The Apostle Paul mentions in a letter that he wrote to some first century Christ followers, he said this, as the spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like him and reflect, back to the mirror analogy, his glory evermore. But here's the thing, becoming like Jesus is a process. In this instant society that we live in, we, you know, we like to think it's a one and done thing. It's not a one and done thing. It's a gradual progressive development that will take the rest of our lives. It's called discipleship. At the meeting place, we like to, to, to say that discipleship is like traveling down a river. We unpacked that a few weeks ago. Russ unpacked that when we talked about our discipleship pathway, and we used the analogy of a river. Because a life with Jesus is like traveling down a river. It's a journey. It's a trip. And it's always moving, and it's an adventure, and it never stops. Referring to this process of becoming a, like Jesus, the Apostle Paul goes on and he writes this, this will continue, this being becoming more like Christ, will continue until we are mature, just as Christ is. And we will be completely like him. We're a work in progress. 
And I think if we gave ourselves some grace and realized that, uh, we would begin to experience that spiritual transformation, begin to develop the character traits that Jesus had, and just understand it's going to take our entire lives. Living surrendered to God, letting him love us, and embracing uh, his presence inside of us, that is what sets us free to become what we are created to be. People who bear God's image. And we do it by loving God and loving others, just like Jesus did. So let me throw this question. Just imagine this for a moment. Imagine what life would be like if we all embraced the idea of being an image bearer of the creator God. Nothing else in creation bears the image of God. Nothing. Not plants, animals, reptiles, insects, birds, fish. Nothing. Which makes you and me pretty darn special. So let's go do our best to represent Jesus to this city and to one another. Really glad that you decided to join on in today. And I hope it, you got some things to think about. But man, what a, what a calling, what a purpose to become more like Jesus. Let's pray. God, uh, man, it can be so easy to get caught up in what's going on in our lives um, and forget, uh, you know, why, we're, why we were created, why we're here. And it's to represent you. And we can lose sight of that so easily. We, we live in a, a messed up world. The, the mirror's been bent. We've all been twisted and we don't reflect your true character to one another. And that's where grace comes in. But help us to be uh, image bearers. Help us to be the light that you call us to be. And together as a church, to be that city on a hill, that beacon of hope for people that are looking for hope. Just thank you for your patience, your kindness, your grace, your mercy, and your forgiveness that you pour out so freely to all, every single one of us. Help us to be more like you so people would want to come to know you. And we pray all of this in your beautiful name. Amen.